again. Sorry about that. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, just one second. Um, hi, <laughs> let me start over. Um, welcome to our annual Sexual and Reproductive Health Awareness Week webinar. Today's webinar is titled, Youth-Friendly Care Happens Here. This fits nicely into this year's SRH Week theme of Youth-Friendly Care, It's Your Right. We're very excited to dive into what youth-friendly care looks like in practice, as well as human rights related to sexual and reproductive health care, and the importance of upholding young people's rights in healthcare settings. Before we get in too deep to the content, we first wanted to share a little bit about who we are and who will be leading today's webinar. So as Sarah mentioned, uh, we're from Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights. And our organization came to be after the 2014 amalgamation of three organizations with over 50 years of history in the field of sexual health and rights. These organizations were the Canadian Federation for Sexual Health, or formerly Planned Parenthood Federation of Canada, Action Canada for Population and Development, and Canadians for Choice. In our current form, Action Canada works to promote and advance sexual and reproductive health and rights, both nationally and globally. And one of the ways we do this is through creating youth health promotion campaigns in collaboration with our National Youth Advisory Board, or what we call the NIAB for short. We struck up a National Youth Advisory Board two and a half years ago when we were funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to produce a series of campaigns encouraging STI testing among youth across Canada. In 2019, we ran one national campaign targeting all youth aged 16 to 24 online with messaging that encouraged youth to think of STI testing as a routine part of healthcare. Building off the success of the first campaign, we adapted the content and messaging to speak to racialized newcomer, immigrant, and refugee youth in the greater Toronto area. And just last week, we launched our third campaign for queer, trans, and two-spirit youth in Saskatoon. This campaign is also an adaptation of the national one, with more specific messaging about STI testing not being a one-size-fits-all thing. And we encourage you to learn more about uh, this campaign at testforyou.ca. Each campaign aims to destigmatize STI testing and demystify the process of going to a clinic, all within the frame of testing being a routine way we can take care of our sexual health. Our final campaign will launch in early 2022 in Calgary to encourage STI testing among young queer men. Action Canada is not a youth-led organization, and so we wanted to ensure that we were applying the principle of nothing for us without us. Basically, if we were speaking about youth in our health promotion campaigns, we wanted to ensure that the campaign direction and content was being informed by youth from the regions and identities who we wanted to reach. Nothing for us without us is a cornerstone of youth engagement. At Action Canada, we strive to ensure that collaboration with young people happen in meaningful, reciprocal, and integrative ways. Youth engagement is guided by the assumption that youth are the experts of their own lives and experiences. So for projects that directly affect the lives of young people, meaningful youth engagement is key to ensuring that youth are valued, that they have an investment in the outcomes, and that the project remains relevant to the people it is meant to serve. It's for these reasons that Action Canada staff are joined in this year's webinar creation and facilitation by three out of 14 members of our National Youth Advisory Board. I'll pass it over to them to introduce themselves and then Action Canada staff will provide a short intro. So I'll pass it on to Jessany now. Um, hi everyone, I am Jessany. My pronouns are she, they. I'm participating from Toronto the traditional territory of many nations, 
including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Shippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Hi everyone, my name is Topazi Yu and my pronouns are she, her, or them, they. I'm currently in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is the Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. Hi, my name is Miranda Pring and my pronouns are she, her. I currently reside in Toronto, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Hi again, um, I'm Makeda Zook. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Health Promotion and Education Officer at Action Canada. I work with our National Youth Advisory Board, some of whom you just met, um, to develop campaign content relevant to youth. I'm joining you all from the West Coast on the unceded land of the Lekwungen speaking peoples where the Esquimalt, Songhees and Wasonic nations have and continue to live today. And I'm Britt Neron and I use they them pronouns. I'm the Health Promotion Officer at Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights. Um, and I work on our 24 hour sexual health information line answering questions and providing support for those seeking sexual health care and information. I'm joining today's call from, un, from Ottawa on unceded Algonquin territory. Action Canada team members live, work, and organize on the unceded and unsurrendered territories of First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples. It's vital that we center our work towards reproductive justice in reconciliation and decolonization. That also includes holding governments to their treaty obligations, ensuring settlers understand the long and ongoing history of institutional reproductive and sexual violence against Indigenous peoples, and recognize that Indigenous communities have long been leading on human rights. One of the reasons why we acknowledge the Indigenous land that we're physically located on is to become engaged in an ongoing process of learning about our relationship to colonialism. Learning about the diversity of Indigenous nations and territories that have existed since time immemorial and continue to exist on what we now call Canada is a first step in situating ourselves within the social, economic, and political histories that continue to impact our experiences and access to potentially life-saving interventions like access to youth-friendly sexual and reproductive health care. We encourage you all to visit nativeland.ca to learn more about which Indigenous territories you live in, the Indigenous names of these lands, and the people and nations within them. If this is the first time that you're hearing about this website, or if you were never taught the names of these Indigenous nations and territories before, we encourage you to continue your learning journey and investigate why this may be the case. So as we mentioned, part of Action Canada's work is to raise awareness around sexual health and wellness through campaigns and content that promotes accurate, comprehensive sexual health information. Sexual and Reproductive Health Awareness Week is one of these campaigns that is at the center of our health promotion work. The yearly campaign allows us to build and offer resources for diverse audiences on different topics related to sexual health because evidence-based, non-judgmental, and reputable sexual health information can often be very difficult to come by. We also have some really exciting news to share with you. Over the last year, we've been working on updating content from previous SRH weeks and moving it all into one website, offering a one-stop shop of comprehensive sexual health information. So we call this the Sexual Health Hub, and on the hub, you'll find information about contraception, STIs, STI testing, HPV vaccines, pregnancy options, healthy relationships, sexual violence, safer sex tips, the impacts of social determinants on sexual health, and a whole lot more. We also have sections for healthcare providers on how to offer sex positive healthcare and on the links between mental health and sexual health. Each month, each month we're launching a new section of content and this month we have launched a section geared specifically towards uh, and developed in collaboration with youth written alongside our National Youth Advisory Board. We encourage you all to check out sections of our Sexual Health Hub at the links that are on the slide. So for a bit of history about SRH Week. SRH Week has been going on for over 16 years. In 2003, SRH Week, which was then just SRH Day, was created in partnership between the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Canadian Federation for Sexual Health, which is now Action Canada. 
as a toolkit for service providers to promote sexual and reproductive health to their community and especially to young people. The campaign continued with new themes emerging every year. And this year, we're excited that we've gone back to the roots of SRH Week by producing content that centers youth. As Makeda mentioned at the beginning, the theme for this year's campaign is youth-friendly care, it's your right. Throughout the week of February 8th to 14th, we'll be promoting the work of our partners, engaging on social media, and centering youth perspectives on what youth-friendly care means to them. SRH Week is a yearly opportunity for all of us to speak about the many ways in which sexual health is a key part of our overall health, about the root causes of public health challenges, to connect across our different sectors, locations, and identities, and to foster a social environment that supports real change. Together, we can deepen our analysis and the work we're already doing on what youth-friendly care means and how we can positively impact the health of all youth. So what can you expect during the campaign? Every year we run an entirely virtual campaign and this year is no different. But with most aspects of our lives transitioning online, we hope that this will open up space for even more individuals and organizations to participate in Sexual Health Awareness Week. Many organizations have been hosting events across the week and the month in order to bring folks together virtually to celebrate the week. Please feel free to share links to your different events or work in the chat. Every year, we also offer a poster that you can hang up in your waiting room, office, clinic, hospital hallway, or community center to highlight Sexual Health Awareness Week. This year, the poster was designed by youth artist Meech Boki. If you want to order one poster or a stack of them, please visit our website. Other content that we've been thrilled to launch this week includes a very large Youth Bill of Rights poster conceptualized and created by Action Canada's National Youth Advisory Board. And there'll be more on this coming up. This poster was also designed by Meech Boki and can be ordered on our website. Each year, we also like to offer a podcast episode, as many of us might prefer that format, uh, to reading dozens of pages of material. This year, our podcast is a conversation between youth leaders at two incredible youth-led sexual health organizations. Native Youth Sexual Health Network, or NISHIN, and Nuance are organizations created by and for youth to address gaps that they identified in their communities. The podcast is hosted by Scott and I at Talking Radical Radio and can be found on our website with all of our SRH Week content. Last but not least, we'll be on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter all week long. We'll be hosting an Instagram Live with our National Youth Advisory Board members on Wednesday, February 10th at 7 p.m. EST. So that's this Wednesday at 7 p.m. EST and sharing content across all of our channels. You can find us at, at, at Action Canada SHR or download our social media toolkit at actioncanadashr.org slash srhweek for some different visuals and messaging you can share to spread the word about youth-friendly sexual health. This year's SRH Week theme was inspired by work that the National Youth Advisory Board, or NIAB, completed on a Youth Bill of Rights poster last year around this same time. As the NIAB and Action Canada staff were brainstorming on directions to take the Saskatoon and Calgary STI testing campaigns, NIAB members mentioned that it would be useful for youth to have information on what human rights they are entitled to when they receive healthcare. While information on why routine STI testing is important, it might all, not always be enough to motivate young people to seek out testing services. Young people must know that when they arrive at a clinic, they will be treated with respect, non-judgment, and as someone capable of making the best choice for their health based on the available information. The NIAB mentioned that as youth, sometimes you come to expect to not be taken seriously or to be talked down to during health appointments. Even if something doesn't feel okay in the context of a health appointment, it can be challenging to know when to push back because healthcare providers have power as adult professionals. The NIAB wanted to ensure that there would be resources to help young people navigate what they have a human right to when accessing care, as well as the kind of professionalism they should expect each and every time they interact with the healthcare system. The Youth Bill of Rights, as Britt mentioned, is a very large physical poster that healthcare providers can put up in their clinics. It serves two purposes. One, as information to youth about the kinds of care they are entitled to receive when they walk through the clinic doors and two, as a visible accountability measure for clinics. 
the poster says to youth, this is the kind of care you can expect to receive here. And for healthcare providers, it reinforces that this is the kind of care you are expected to provide. In this way, the poster nicely complements work we've done to build up our directory of youth-friendly health, uh, sexual health providers. To be an Action Canada certified youth-friendly clinic with, within our service provider directory, you must have been vetted using a benchmark of best practices. This benchmark document reflects much of what is in the Youth Bill of Rights, but the audience is healthcare providers and clinics instead of youth. To learn more about our youth-friendly benchmarks or how to be added to our directory of sexual health providers, contact Brit. And don't worry, uh, both of our emails will be at the end slide so that you can easily contact us after the webinar. We know from conducting youth focus groups across the country that the most common barrier to getting an STI test is stigma. From youth, we heard that there is stigma surrounding all areas of sexuality and sexual health. There are the experiences of being judged by adult professionals for engaging in sexual activity as teenagers. There is also the fear of having to disclose being queer and or trans to health providers. There is also a fear of being judged by peers if youth received a positive STI test result. As much as there are major barriers to youth accessing youth-friendly sexual and reproductive health care, we also know that there are major barriers for health professionals in providing the kinds of care that youth have a right to. These barriers include a lack of funding and staffing resources at clinics that specialize in sexual health care, a lack of curriculum on sexual and reproductive health care within medical school, and a lack of ongoing professional development for clinicians who have been in the field for a long while. There are also barriers we're seeing growing bigger in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. These include a healthcare system, financial resources, and workers who are stretched beyond measure. It also includes the ways that the embedded racism and colonialism within all systems and institutions, including healthcare, has been laid bare throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. The perceived and actual stigma youth experience when it comes to accessing sexual health care, combined with previous negative experiences of not being treated with respect or dignity because of age, identities, and social locations, leads young people to fear accessing health care of all kinds. The Youth Bill of Rights poster that the NIAB created translates human rights enshrined at the UN to what these rights look like in practice within healthcare settings. Knowing what we have the right to and what to look for when accessing healthcare is crucial in empowering people at any age to take care of all aspects of our health and well being. Our goal with this year's SRH Week theme is to share information and resources that are relevant to youth who are seeking sexual health information. So, this includes information about what youth have a right to when it comes to accessing sexual health care. This year's theme also has a secondary goal of engaging healthcare providers on how to best ensure that the care they provide is truly youth friendly. So what exactly do we mean when we say youth friendly care? We mean care that centers the needs and experiences of youth. We mean care that believes youth and takes their health concerns seriously. We mean care that critically examines how the intersections of systemic oppressions like racism, colonialism, ableism, trans and queer phobia impact young people's access to sexual and reproductive health care differentially. Youth-friendly care is non-judgmental and stigma-free. This means actively challenging stereotypes about youth. Stereotypes about youth show up everywhere and nowhere is this more pronounced than sex and sexuality. Often youth are assumed to be engaging in risky sexual activities and are assumed to be in need of protective interventions. Or on the flip side, they're viewed as innocent, passive individuals who are in need of adult protection. So either way you flip it, this is a paternalistic or top-down approach to addressing the sexual and reproductive health care needs of young people. Youth-friendly sexual and reproductive health care challenges this top-down approach and instead sees youth as experts of their bodies, lives, and sexualities. Healthcare providers play an important role in providing their clients with up-to-date scientific knowledge, including medical diagnoses or treatment options. 
During this exchange, deeply listening to your youth clients can provide crucial information to help determine together what kinds of prevention or treatment they can access. Youth-friendly care also means being mindful of the power dynamics inherent to a visit between a young person and their healthcare provider. Healthcare providers hold significant institutional power while youth are often not taken seriously or have their needs denied. So for healthcare to be impactful and to work, there needs to be an exchange of information and knowledge, an awareness of power dynamics and some efforts to mitigate them, and perhaps most importantly, a letting go of assumptions about what the young person in front of you is experiencing. For example, we saw this play out over and over again in building our youth STI testing campaigns. For young people, or young people um, often knew that they should get tested for STIs if they were sexually active, but they feared the social stigma that comes with getting a positive result and felt that getting tested, no matter the result, was admitting that they had done something um, in their own words as shameful or irresponsible. Youth also consistently spoke about previous negative experiences like racism, transphobia, heterosexism, and stigma in healthcare that impacted whether they would seek out sexual health services like STI testing. Creating the space for youth to share their concerns and needs and to know that they will be believed and viewed as whole humans will positively impact how likely they are to take in sexual health information and follow up on recommended health advice. And beyond just the immediate, the immediate health outcomes, it creates the conditions for young people to more confidently navigate their relationships and to feel more confident, comfortable, and supported in their identities. So what do we mean when we say youth-friendly care is your right? Youth-friendly care is part of a human rights framework. When we're talking about access to sexual and reproductive health care, we are talking about sexual rights or human rights applied to sexuality. Sexual rights are crucial to the realization of overall health and equity. They are essential to safety and dignity, freedom from discrimination and harm. The Youth Bill of Rights poster is based on the sexual rights that youth are entitled to. Without these rights being upheld, access to health care can be challenging. And to take care of our sexual health, we need to be able to access health care. Access to sexual and reproductive health services can be unequal because of things like where we live or our immigration status. There are many structural barriers that can get in the way of access, and for youth, there can be even more barriers. For instance, parents or guardians might hold on to a young person's health card, or if a teen lives in a smaller town or a close-knit community, the doctor could be a family friend and they might be unsure or nervous about privacy and confidentiality. Young people have the right to go to the doctor and get care without parental consent or permission from an, from an adult. Young people also have a right to privacy. But enough for me. Um, sorry about that. Uh, enough for me. Uh, Jessany, Miranda, and Topaza will spend the next section of the webinar going over in detail what young people have the right to, what this looks like in the context of clinical and public health settings, how healthcare providers can support in realizing these rights, and the impact on youth of not receiving access to youth friendly sexual health services. So hi, I'm Jessany, and I want to discuss the importance of non-discrimination and respect for young people within the clinic space. When a young person steps into a clinic, we want to feel that we are respected and not discriminated against so that we can wholly talk about our health matters with health professionals. And in fact, it is not just about what we want, but it is also about what young people have a human right to. When it comes to youth-friendly care, a safe environment is the key. Young people may have, young people must have their pronouns respected by professionals and must not face any discriminate actions and or attitudes in the clinic. Teenagers may become used to adults not considering them or their concerns seriously, but this is a form of disrespect and discrimination based on their age. Other forms of discrimination are no, also not acceptable. Young people have the right to not experience such as racism, blood shaming, transphobia, homophobia, fatphobia, or ableism when accessing care. 
Personally, as a young person, whenever I come to a clinic, I tend to worry whether health professionals, many of whom are way older than me, understand the youth concerns. This personal worry has deterred me from sharing all of my problems because I was scared of not being understood and therefore felt embarrassed. Thus, knowing that everyone has their own unique experiences, it is every young person's right to be treated with respect and dignity by health professionals. This helps make the process of getting healthcare less scary and overwhelming for young people, meaning better health outcomes in the long run. It can be done with healthcare providers' simple actions, such as informing youth of their rights within a clinic, actively asking for youth pronouns, both verbally and on intake forms, reassuring youth about their concerns with kindness and respect, taking youth-related concerns seriously, respect youth no and asking for their permission before touching them. These basic yet critical actions would help young people to feel assured at a clinic, and thus they will feel comfortable seeking help from health providers when they need to. Within the clinic environment, being aware that many health professionals have inherent power because they are highly educated and informed on medical matters is an important starting point for youth-friendly care. Acknowledging this power dynamic within a healthcare setting can help healthcare providers deliver the kinds of care that center the needs and expertise of youth who come into the offices. While health providers are experts in the field, they are not experts when it comes to experiences of young people. And yet, young people tend to doubt themselves in healthcare settings. For example, we might question whether our concerns or problems are observed to greatly respected healthcare providers. If we doubt ourselves within healthcare generally, this is 10 times more true for sexual and reproductive health care because of the stigma and taboo with sex and sexuality. One of my friends told me that they often were so afraid of asking more than five questions to the physician they were meeting because they were ashamed of their accent and felt that they could be seen as dumb by asking too many questions. It is examples like this that illustrate some of the systemic barriers that young people face, including previous experiences of racism and ageism, and that these barriers are even more pronounced and complex for those of us who are newcomers. Action Canada National Youth Advisory Board created the Youth Feel of Right poster because we wanted to ensure that youth know their rights when they walk into the clinic setting to receive sexual health care. Young people have a right to be heard and to be taken seriously without judgment so that they can ask as many questions and share as much relevant information as they want to with healthcare providers. Ultimately, this will benefit everyone. It will help healthcare professionals provide an excellent standard of care. It will grow young people's confidence in sexual and reproductive health providers, encouraging them to visit the clinic again, and it will lead to better health outcomes for youth. Finally, young people deserve to be taken care of by healthcare providers who understand their cultural needs and therefore give them the most cultural competent solutions. For example, one of my Asian friends shared that she wanted to seek birth control options from a clinic that would suit her particular Asian cultural context. For her, what this meant was helping her find birth control without letting her parents know. She comes from a conservative family, so she was quite scared of them knowing that she was on birth control. She told me that she finally was given this option that suited her the most, but before that, she was shamed for this concern and told by her healthcare provider that society these days was much more open. So her worry about people knowing that she was taking birth control was invalid and generally not a concern. In this example, before my friend received the culturally competent care she was looking for, my friend was not listened to her cultural context was disrespected and her concerns around confidentiality and privacy dismissed. Even though she finally got what she wanted, this bad experience made a long lasting impression on her, which has deterred her from visiting other sexual health clinics since. 
Canada is known for its rich variety of cultures, and because of this, healthcare professionals must be aware of and understand the cultural differences that can pose unique difficulties and needs to young patients' healthcare and give culturally suitable options for all patients, including youth. This will result in more positive experiences in the healthcare system, healthier people, and communities. I'll pass it to Miranda. Thanks, Jessany. This next section is closely intertwined with Jessany's section on respect. I'll be discussing confidentiality and information in healthcare settings. Youth, like anyone else, value our privacy. We want to trust that what we tell doctors and other healthcare professionals remains confidential. Our privacy should be respected just as much as any other patient. And should there be any limits to confidentiality, then we should know that they exist before we begin disclosing information. You would think that confidentiality and privacy of the information we share with healthcare professionals would be a no-brainer, that of course, every doctor would respect this basic right. However, you'll find many anecdotes of youth whose parents or relatives will obtain this information, either by a seemingly harmless slip of the tongue by the doctor, such as, ah, I just saw your child here the other day, or by an intentional invasion of privacy, such as, tell me if so-and-so has been here recently, what did they want? It is important that physicians remember to respect this basic right to privacy and confidentiality when it comes to their youth patients. As patients, we have the right to know what is going on. We deserve to know what is happening and who is treating us. We deserve to know what is happening during an appointment and why it is happening. Healthcare professionals have a reputation of not having a lot of time with patients and may end up not taking the time to explain things to us. This tendency seems to be worse, worse with youth, like we don't need to know what's going on since the doctor is the expert and because of this, it's seen as not, not worth explaining. We should be told why certain tests are being performed. For example, why do you need to touch certain areas of our body or why do you need us to undress? For example, why did my allergy specialist need to see my bare chest in order to use his stethoscope? Why did he need to go under my clothes without warning? We should know why things are happening so we can determine if it's unnecessary or inappropriate. Youth deserve to know what is being recorded on our chart and who has access to that information. Is this information being linked or shared elsewhere with other providers, for example? We also deserve to know next steps. Often it is unclear when an appointment is even over or, when, or what the doctor plans to do next. The doctor can be halfway through the door before we realize. Simple things such as, I will send these tests and please call back in a week. Do you have any questions? Otherwise, our appointment is done. Is enough to summarize the appointment and your patient will know what's going to happen next. We deserve to know who is treating us. You'd think that if we have an appointment with, an, with a doctor, that we know who the doctor is. Unfortunately, that isn't always the case. For example, in a walk-in clinic with multiple doctors, a doctor may stroll in, mumble their name, and just as quickly as they came in, they leave. This proves even more difficult at a hospital where any number of doctors could be working there. Sometimes a patient will see multiple people in the clinic, from the front desk to nurses, to lab technicians, to volunteers. Being clear on what each person's role is and how it pertains to the patient's treatment and care is a really important part of understanding what is going on in the context of sexual health care. Often, no explanation is given, or if one is given, it's short and it's not clear what our options are. So for example, a physician may bring in an assistant or a student into the examination room, but not introduce who they are or what their role is. We deserve to know who is treating us and should we wish, check if there are any official complaints or allegations against a doctor or other healthcare professional. Therefore, it's important for a doctor to properly introduce themselves or leave information for the patient that they can easily access. Should your patient need to file a complaint, they should know exactly who is treating them so that future patients will not have to in endure in inappropriate actions by a specific healthcare professional. We deserve to have all the information about our appointment and understand what is happening. It is your job to explain it to us in a way that we understand, in a language we understand, including plain language. Using plain language is super important, especially in the context of sexual and reproductive health care. This is because all things sex and sexuality are already stigmatized and highly personal, and so for young people to talk about these subjects with adults who are seen as experts is already a challenge. 
in order for young people to talk openly and honestly and ask the questions that is most on their minds, healthcare professionals can use plain language to talk through medical issues as a way to help young people feel more comfortable to ask questions and clarifications, thus ensuring that we can give you as much information as possible in order to receive from you the best care possible. Using plain language does not only help those who do not understand, uh, sorry, who do not know medical language, which is most people regardless of age, but plain language also helps us understand what is happening in the context of the appointment and also empowers us to take care of our health and complete any follow-ups that might be necessary now and into the future. Not only should your language be plain, but efforts should be made for language barriers to be accommodated. Everyone deserves timely, timely safe, and appropriate health care. Often individuals who do not speak an official language of the country, in our case, English or French, face substantial challenges to access. access a, Accessing healthcare in your language is a part of healthcare equity. Interpreter and translation services, including sign language interpretation, should be made available so both the healthcare professional and client can have all the necessary information required to obtain the best possible care. Once we are given all appropriate information, we are then able to make informed decisions and can choose the course of action that works best for us, including refusal of a certain care route. I'll pass it on to Topaza. Thank you. Lastly, here I will explore some, but not all of the youth's right to choose and refuse healthcare services. What is always my, my experience as a BIPOC youth with the Canadian healthcare system positive is the ability and freedom for me to practice my rights as a youth to choose and refuse the type of healthcare service that best serves my health with the guidance of a healthcare professional. As youths, we have the rights to know about the risk and benefits of medication, procedures, and tests before making a choice. The following list includes, but it's not limited to the different ways that we as students practice our human rights to choose and refuse healthcare services. Number one, being able to choose how the clinic would communicate with us after our appointment, whether that is through the phone, text, email, or mail, we should also be able to specify whether a message can be left. This is especially important when talking about sexual and reproductive health care because of how taboo and stigmatized youth sexuality can be. Specifying whether the clinic has permission to leave a message can help ensure our human rights to privacy and confidentiality that Miranda just mentioned are respected. Number two, being able to bring a support person like a family member or a friend into our appointments. For me, the impact of this cannot be overstated. I've always found that bringing a friend into my STI testing appointments does not only ease my anxiety, but also serves as an easy outlet for my friends to learn and familiarize themselves with the STI testing process. This can serve as a way to normalize and destigmatize STI testing amongst youths. I know with COVID restrictions in place, this becomes less possible, but it should be something that we strive for this whenever we can. Number three, the ability to ask for a new healthcare provider without any explanation. As many youths, including myself, have been afraid to ask for a new healthcare provider due to perceived higher level of authority and power imbalance a doctor may have over a youth. The perception can be really discouraging to youths, which can prevent them from accessing all the healthcare services that they want or need. Number four, being able to receive timely referrals of our current provider can offer a certain service. And this can be a referral to a mental health practitioner, a specialist, or another family physician. Providing timely referral is incredibly important in any kind of healthcare. But this is especially important for sexual reproductive health. For example, abortion care is too challenging to access in Canada. And this is especially true if, like me, you live in a smaller city like Saskatoon or in a rural location. And most doctors who provide abortion care are concentrated in Canada's major cities like Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. Abortion care is something where time is of the essence in terms of ensuring access. If your regular doctor or client does not provide abortion care, and most don't unfortunately, people of all ages, including youths, have a right to receive a timely and relevant referral. This is even the case if the doctor has a conscientious objection while the doctor have a right to not provide abortion care, they also have a professional responsibility to provide immediate referral because withholding this information can cause potential harm to the patient. 
Number five, having the freedom to choose the course of action best for the youth. This includes refusing any care or services offered. If we refuse care or choose one treatment option over another, healthcare providers must explain what consequences this choice will have so that youths can make an informed decision with all the available information. An example of this is sometimes youths are prescribed hormonal birth control to treat acne. Young people should be told in clear and easy to understand language regarding all the benefits and risk of using hormonal birth control to treat acne. If they do decide to refuse this course of treatment, they should be also be told about any risk of refusal, not in a fear-inducing way, but in a calm and scientifically accurate way. Also keeping in mind, there are a few exceptions to this where in Quebec, the age of consent to choose or to refuse medical care is 14 years old and in New Brunswick is 16 years old. And number six, being able to share as much or as little information as we feel comfortable and are wish to. It is important to respect the amount and level of information that we as the youth provide you. And as mentioned by Jezini, the importance of fostering an environment that is non-discriminatory, your pa patient's personal information is highly respected. Last, but definitely not least, being able to refuse to have a student or observer present. Youths, including myself, have been and can be afraid of saying no in the context of an appointment because we want to ensure that we are receiving the best care. And it can be very intimidating to tell a doctor, someone who's seen as an expert, who has access to more power than us, no, because we don't want to upset them in any way. In sexual reproductive health care especially, it can be extremely vulnerable to have a student or observer present, especially if we've never met them before or know anything about them. This is because sexual health is already a sensitive and stigmatized subject. And for many young people who are navigating this challenging social, emotional, and physical terrain of learning about their bodies, health, and sexuality, it can act as one more barrier to us being able to ask questions from the doctor and therefore as a barrier to receiving the best possible care. So it is very vital for healthcare professionals to uphold these guidelines and respect our choices as this can further foster and cultivate a positive and safe space for us to access inclusive health care. Freedom for us to practice our rights to choose and refuse can also equip us with a sense of confidence over our own health care and a sense of autonomy that we have control of deciding the type of health care services that best meets our own unique needs. Thanks so much, Topaza, Miranda, and Justine. The practice of providing youth-friendly care is one that we all have to work together to build. Outlining what the rights of youth are to receiving care that speaks to their needs is one part of what it means to provide youth-friendly care. It takes all of us, health providers, public health professionals, policymakers, youth, advocates and activists to challenge the often status quo approach to healthcare. It takes more investment, like investment in financial and human resources. And it takes investment in community clinics, health, sexual health centers and youth driven organizations already leading in and doing this work. Many of the people listening to this webinar are likely in those clinics, sexual health centers and youth led organizations already doing this work and doing it phenomenal, phenomenally. <laughs> but like any kind of practice, there is always more to learn. And the more we center youth as experts and pay them for their knowledge, ideas, and labor, the more deeply we will learn, the more we will improve our practices, and the more we will ensure that we are upholding their rights in the context of providing sexual and reproductive health care. So how do we start this practice? There are a few things that you can do this week to help amplify the importance of youth-friendly sexual and reproductive health care, such as you could put up posters and start a conversation with your coworkers. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Action Canada SHR. Check out our social media toolkit. You can order more posters, share content, and have open conversations about youth-friendly care. You can also use the hashtags SRH2021, Youth Friendly Care, 
Um, and all of this is, is on our website, um, on the SRH Week website that Britt mentioned earlier on and on one of the earlier slides. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat now or get in touch by email with Britt or I. Um, our emails, as I said, are, are on the slide. Um, and we will also be sending out the slides so that you have all of the website information um, and everything right at your right at your fingertips. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us and talking with us about youth-friendly healthcare. We'll now open it up to questions. Great, thank you very much for the presentation today. I'm just going to. Okay. So I would like to open it up for any questions that you may have for the presenters. Using the Q&A function on the bottom of your toolbar, please send your questions in when you are ready. As mentioned, please feel free to ask your question in English or French. I will read the question out loud before the presenters provide a response. While we're waiting for any questions to come in, I would just like to remind you that we will be sending a copy of today's presentation to you by email, as well as a feedback form on today's webinar. So I see that we have some questions that have come in. 